it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Adrian Gilmore. Um, Dr. Gilmore received his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis, where he worked with Kathleen McDermott. Um, during his PhD, he investigated parietal lobe contributions to human memory and how these relate to subjective aspects of memory retrieval. Um, and during this time, he also began to investigate the cortical networks that support autobiographical memory retrieval and other related processes. So Dr. Gilmore is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute of Mental Health, where he works with Alex Martin. Um, and here he continues to study human memory using a combination of behavioral and functional imaging methods. And recently his work has particularly focused on autobiographical memory and ways in which the hippocampus and neocortex support uh, the vivid recall of events. So um, I'm excited to hear about some of Dr. Gilmore's latest work today. And um, as usual, if you have any questions throughout the talk, you can just post them in the chat and I can read them out. Um, if you prefer to ask your question out loud, you can also um, send me a message or raise your hand as well, whichever you'd prefer. So with that, whenever you're ready, um, Adrian, I'll hand over to you. Okay, uh, can I just get a nod that everyone can see that coming through okay? Fantastic, all right. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the invite and uh, thank you, Sherry, for the introduction as well. Uh, thank all of you for tuning in today. Uh, so uh, as Sherry mentioned, something I'm really interested in is uh, memories for our own life experiences, autobiographical memories. Uh, and to get started, I really just wanted to kind of give everyone a sense of why it is that I think that that's kind of something interesting, something worth, uh, worth studying. So what I'm showing here is a picture uh, taken actually close to this time last year. Uh, this was early on in the pandemic days before we knew that we were early in the pandemic days. Uh, and my uh, partner, my daughter and I had gone off to sort of take a walk uh, at a nearby beach. And there's a few things I can remember from that day. I can remember that uh, due to a GPS lag, I almost missed a very important left-hand turn. Uh, I can remember that the wind was uh, blowing so strong when we were at the beach that my daughter, who was barely a year old at the time, actually couldn't stand up. Every time she tried, she'd just get blown right back down. Uh, but of course, I can remember a lot of other aspects of that day that aren't just these little disconnected, disparate pieces of information. Uh, rather, what I can do is kind of put myself back there and just let certain uh, episodes of that day kind of play out in my mind's eye. Uh, so this, this photo here is actually a short video. Uh, and I can see this in my head, just as you can hopefully see it on your screens. Uh, I'm going to get a little wave from uh, my wife. My daughter is going to look at us. Uh, then they're going to keep walking. Uh, you're going to see my wife run, run, run ahead of my daughter, offer her a hug, and get completely blown off. Right? Just She's just going to go right by her. Doesn't even matter. Um, and the fact that I can do that, that I can be sitting here in this room right now, but also a year away from now in my mind's eye is something that was, has always been interested to me and is, is actually why I went to grad school in the first place. So how do we do that? That's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, how we do that part. Uh, so I'm going to begin by focusing on the hippocampus uh, and sort of some conflicting or varying ideas about how it might help us remember uh, events in a very rich manner. Uh, then I'm going to pivot a little bit to talk about uh, some ways in which uh, the lab has been trying to probe autograph autobiographical memories using a, a slightly different approach than has historically been done. Uh, we're going to pivot back to the hippocampus and ask how um, this new approach of actually just having people talk in a scanner uh, might help us learn something about how we might differently be able to remember events that happened very recently versus those that happened a long time ago. Uh, and then finally, I'll just end on a few uh, sort of future direction notes of places I think we'd like to take this uh, based on what we've seen so far. So let's go ahead and get going, dive right in. So the hippocampus, uh, as everyone who's passed Psych 101 is aware, and it's actually many people who have not passed Psych 101 are aware, the hippocampus is located deep in your medial temporal lobes. Uh, it turns out it's about 1% of your brain by volume if you'd like a, a little kind of trivia note for today. Uh, and if there's one thing that we know, it's that this is important for healthy memory function. I feel like that's one of the few kind of, we can all agree on that sort of statements in, in psychology and neuroscience. Uh, and that's not something we've always known. Uh, in fact, we didn't really have a good sense of that until the late 1950s uh, when we uh, found out kind of the hard way how critical it is. Uh, so this is a picture here of patient HM, who as uh, you may be aware, was severely epileptic uh, and as a young man underwent an experimental surgery in which large sections of his medial temporal lobes were uh, 
resected bilaterally. Uh, the good news was that this did in fact help with the epilepsy. Uh, the bad news was uh, that it rendered him very densely amnesic. He was no longer capable of forming any new memories uh, after the surgery. Uh, I should point out that when I say uh, large sections of his medial temporal lobe, this is not sort of an overstatement. There were in fact very large sections removed. Uh, this encompasses tissue well beyond the hippocampus, um, but kind of critically for what I'm going to talk about today, this, as far as we can tell, pretty much left the hippocampus itself completely deafferented. So nothing was going in there anymore. Uh, however, what I also want to focus on today, though, is not the fact that he had memory trouble or really trying to say that the hippocampus per se was behind some specific deficit, but I want to talk about something that HM uh, could still do, or at least it was reported very early on that he could still do. This was something we realized pretty quickly. Uh, and this actually is from the, you know, kind of famous Scoville and Milner 57 paper. So he had a complete loss of memory for events that occurred after his surgery. Uh, he had kind of a partial loss of memory for things that uh, occurred within a few years of the surgery, but for all intents and purposes, things that occurred, you know, in his childhood uh, sort of era, things like that, he could still remember those just fine. Uh, which is to say that he had what you could call a temporally graded form of amnesia. And I'm just going to kind of graphically depict what I had sort of underlined there on that last text passage. So from the point of surgery forward, he could no longer create new memories, at least new episodic declarative memories. Uh, and then when you go behind that, there is a short uh, little section here where he had some kind of loss of memory. It's not exactly clear exactly how long it's had a few years. But then when you get back toward childhood, these memories are really intact. Now, this pattern of, of a temporally graded uh, Amnesia is not something that is unique to HM or even just unique to hippocampal patients. Uh, if you look at individuals that suffer from traumatic brain injuries, you can see something very similar. Uh, electroconvulsive therapy produces very similar uh, kind of phenomena in humans. Uh, and then if you look at animals uh, and uh, hippocampal lesion studies, it's very typical for, let's say, rodents or you know, mice, rats, whatever have you, to lose uh, recently acquired memories, but somehow be able to remember things that they learned a long time ago. So based on all of this literature, uh, something that's come to be known as a standard model of consolidation was forwarded and it's really been championed uh, primarily by Larry Squire over the years, although certainly not exclusively him. Uh, and the idea here is that a new memory is dependent upon the hippocampus uh, for retrieval. So if I wanna remember what I had for dinner last night, um, then I need my hippocampus functioning to help me think back to that specific event. Uh, however, over time, the cortex actually slowly learns through a process that is termed consolidation. Um, it, it learns to retrieve events on its own, so it no longer needs a hippocampus. And there's a point at which you really don't need a hippocampus at all. So for recent things you do, for remote, you need them less and less until you don't need one anymore. And that would then explain things like this temporal gradient that, that HM and others have, have exhibited. Uh, now that is great at explaining a whole bunch of data, uh, but there is a problem. Uh, and the problem is uh, a phenomenological one. So as memories get older, as things, we're trying to remember things that happened longer and longer ago, they're typically less detailed, right? So if you think back to, again, what you had for dinner last night, you probably can remember a fair bit. If I ask you for what you had, uh, about what you had for dinner, let's say a month ago, it's gonna be maybe a lot harder or certainly a lot harder, uh, unless it was a particularly notable dinner occasion. Uh, so this then kind of raises a, a question here of, well, do we see this, pattern in hippocampal patients because time has passed and there's enough time that things have been consolidated to the cortex? Or do we see this pattern because they can remember things that, or they just don't remember things very well. They're just, they're just kind of just like. Um, and so there's sort of this, this just versus time debate or detail versus time debate, I guess, that, that you could talk about. Uh, and that's really been most clearly argued, uh, I would say, by uh, Morris Moscovich and Lynn Nadell, although others have put out kind of similar theories in recent years. Uh, and this alternative account that emphasizes it's the amount of detail that seems to matter for hippocampal involvement and not just time per se um, is known as multiple trace theory. Uh, and here the idea is that you just flat out always need a hippocampus to remember an event in detail. Um, the, by the way, the theory is, is called multiple trace because the idea is that each time you think back to an event, you actually re-encode it, you store it again in your hippocampus. This has the uh, effect of kind of smearing it across larger and larger sections of the hippocampus. Um, you're forming multiple memory traces to use um, kind of a psych lingo, I guess. Uh, and then when you see things like a temporal gradient, like we observed in HM, then that is actually the result of 
the smearing process. So because this thing, memory has been recalled so many times over the years, even if there's a lot of tissue damage, there's enough residual tissue left somehow that you can sort of reconstruct this type of memory. Uh, or alternatively, for things that happened just a really long time ago, really far away, then uh, those aren't really memories in the way that, that we're talking about here. It's more like knowledge. And I can say that I know, for instance, at the age of two, I fell and have a little scar on my chin from that. I do not remember what happened that day. I just know that it happened. It's knowledge in the same way that I know George Washington was the first American president. Um, and we know we don't need hippocampus to you know, sort of uh, retrieve or even uh, gain new knowledge. So, all right, we have two ideas here. One, it's uh, kind of time that tells us whether or not we need hippocampus to recall things. In another case, it's the amount of detail. Um, and these two tend to be conflated, so we're having an issue. Now we can turn outside the human lesion uh, data, uh, and that might be a good idea here since we've been arguing about this for coming on 40, 50 years now and haven't reached a good conclusion. Uh, and we can look at, let's say, the animal literature. Uh, well, as I mentioned, uh, actually one of the reasons that the standard model came to be a thing was because there's a lot of evidence that you can find something like a temporally graded uh, pattern of memory loss in uh, animal models. Um, but that's not universally true. You can certainly find cases where both recent and remote memory seem to be impaired by hippocampal lesions. It's true in mice and rodents. Um, okay, well, that's fine. If this is about details, maybe we shouldn't really be worried about talking to rodents anyway, because they can't answer questions about how detailed some memory is that they're trying to re-experience, right? Uh, so we can just put healthy individuals in a scanner. We can say, hey, young adult, 18 to 24, who's probably a college student, come on to an experiment with us. Uh, we're going to ask you to remember things that happened recently, happened a long time ago, uh, and we'll see what's going on in your hippocampus. Well, a lot of folks have done that, and as I have noted on here, uh, those are also ultimately equivocal. So if you want to find evidence supporting either of the two kind of main positions here, you can certainly do that. Um, just to kind of offer a few concrete examples of that last point. So here's a paper from Ty Constable's group, uh, came out around 15 years ago, and the title kind of tells you what they found, uh, which is that if you compare uh, activity that um, was measured during the recall of recent memory, so this is a couple of days ago, versus remote memories, something like eight years ago, you can see that in the recent case, here's your hippocampus, by the way, if you're not used to looking at digital brains like this, and you can see clear bilateral activation. Good, that's fine, everyone would predict that. But then when we go to the remote condition over here, um, this is still the hippocampus, and this red blob still means that it's being activated. And if anything, in terms of aerial extent, it's being activated more for remote memories than for recent memories. So that would not suggest some kind of time-limited role. We're talking about days versus years. On the other hand, let's say that for some reason I don't like Todd Constable's data, maybe I, I don't know, I, don't like how we did that experiment or whatever. I think it's a fine experiment, by the way, but let's just hypothetically say that. Uh, I can turn to a different paper from a different group that came out right around the same time. Uh, and here, this was uh, a group of folks who were interested not only in the remoteness of memories, but also their emotionality, whether they were positive or negative. Uh, and what you can see here, uh, and so this is, uh, by the way, recent memories in this case are in the last few years, remote is like childhood. Um, and then you have, two columns here in the recent. This is for positive negative memories. We're not gonna even worry about that for right now. Uh, what you can see is that in the case of recent memories, you definitely need a hippocampus on the right or the left side. Um, and on the other hand, for remote memories, mm -mm. nope, you either don't need it on the left or maybe slightly anti-needed on the right. So two papers, completely inconsistent conclusions, not a great state of being. So, what the heck do we do? I have just reviewed three different literatures and I basically said, hey, we have two great ideas and we don't know which one is the right idea, um, which stinks, basically. That's not what we're in business for. So um, I'm going to be honest and say that I don't work with patients and I'm not going to offer suggestions on ways we can try to break this deadlock with um, you know, human patient data. Uh, I haven't touched an animal model since undergrad and I intend to leave it that way, so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but I do a whole lot of human neuroimaging. So what I want to do now is just talk about ways we might be able to sort of gain some new knowledge on what's basically an old and deadlocked question uh, using human imaging work. So what I want to do is just explain how it is that we ask people to recall autobiographical memories when, when they're in the scanner. And I think this is important um, for reasons that will become very clear in just a moment. So typically what we do, uh, is we ask people to go in a scanner. Apparently we sometimes forget to put a head coil on. So in this case, it would be hard to collect data, but let's ignore that for now. 
we then give people a bunch of cues. These could be pictures, these could be words, doesn't really matter. The idea is that we show you something and it helps kind of trigger a specific event in your mind's eye. Let's say maybe that this person happens to be my, my partner and she's thinking back to that same day at the beach that I was describing before. Now you give someone 10 or 20 seconds to let this event play out in their mind's eye. They're silently thinking about this. Uh, and then at the end of a trial, uh, they either A, go on to the next trial, or B, are asked to give you something like a rating. How vivid is this on a scale from one to five? Or, or how difficult was it to think of a specific memory based on this cue that we gave you? And that's kind of what we do. Uh, and I think that's actually worked pretty well for us for a variety of reasons, but there's a problem here. Uh, and that problem comes down to the fact that we're asking people to covertly recall things. So for 10 or 20 seconds, you're thinking about some memory. And again, maybe you're giving me a quick rating at it, or maybe you do it at the end of the scan. Either way, that's really all I have to work with. Uh, and what that means is that as experimenters, we don't really know what it is that people are thinking about. I can assume that you're probably thinking about an event related to the queue, that's fine, but I don't know how many details, how, how detailed this, this event is. I don't know the order in which you're thinking about different aspects of that experience. We don't know how long you're thinking about any of those aspects of the experience. Uh, and when you get back to the, the basic problem here, which is maybe this is about time, maybe this is about detail, detail and time seem to be confounded in some way, then how, how can we use imaging in, in this sort of paradigm to really disentangle those? And the answer is you can't really do it easily. And I'm going to take a quick moment here, um, both to, to defend past Adrian, but also many, many, many other researchers who have done studies like this. I am not saying that covert recall is not a completely viable way to study human memory. I think we've learned a lot from it. Uh, here's a recent meta-analysis of 79 different uh, experiments that have been conducted relating to autobiographical recall. Um, and you can actually see that there are fairly focal parts of the brain that show up over and over and over again. You can call this the default mode or the core recollection network. People have used many other terms. But the point is the covert recall experiments have definitely taught us something about the parts of the brain that are important for letting you retrieve a past episode. So I'm not saying that covert recall is bad. But what I'm saying is that I think that there are some inherent limitations we have to recognize exist when you have someone quietly talking in a scanner for a while. So what is the proposed solution here? What am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about deleting a single letter. We're just going to scratch out that C and we're going to get rid of it. And now suddenly we're not in a covert recall type situation, but we're in an overt recall situation. What does that mean? Well, people aren't going to be silently thinking about things. Instead, they would describe it aloud. That solves some of these problems here pretty quickly because now we know, at least based on what's being verbalized, what's being recalled, when it's being recalled relative to other parts of an experience, how long they're thinking about various aspects of an experience. Uh, and then hopefully this would also then help to disentangle how old a memory is from how much detail it may or may not have, because we have some type of verbal report. So that's the idea. And then the question becomes, after attempting uh, to, and hopefully successfully, accounting for the content of recalled memories, can we then find evidence that kind of helps us get back to this question of whether we need a hippocampus or not to recall events? And will that evidence kind of dictate that it looks more like the hip, uh, standard model consolidation where you need a hippocampus for a time limited period or more like multiple traits where you just consistently need uh, a hippocampus if you'd like to vividly recall something. So now I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about how we've uh, tried to do that. And what I wanna do first is actually just discuss sort of in, in a, a high level sense, what you need then if you wanna switch from all right, I can ask someone to think about something for five or 10 or 20 seconds to I need you to talk about something for you know, a way that lets me measure what you're thinking about maybe. Oops. And that's not what I wanna do, that's what I wanna do. Okay, so the first thing we need is to transition from a 10 or 20 second period, which does not give someone a lot of time to talk about what an experience was like to a much longer period. And I'm talking several minutes type length. Um, we also, of course, need to have usable fMRI data. So now that we have people talking for several minutes at a time continuously in a scanner, uh, we need to make sure that the data actually aren't junk. Uh, and I should point out that, excuse me, one of the big reasons people do overt recall in a, or I'm sorry, do covert recall in a scanner is because head motion is really, really, really bad for fMRI data quality. This is something we've known about since forever. So an easy way to do that is not to have people talk. 
but let's say that we are going to have people talk. We need to make sure that it happens in a way where the data can be analyzed in a, in a useful sense. Once we've done that, uh, then we're only just starting because now we have to take this naturally described event. This is just like if you were talking to a friend on a Friday night, let's say over Zoom, since we don't really meet in person anymore, and you're talking about what you did that week, right? You're just going to kind of tell an event, it'll go here, hither and thither, and eventually kind of get to what happened, but it will not be necessarily a, durate, uh, a straight start to finish description of the event. So you have to have a way of, of classifying and breaking that long continuous thing up into discrete units that we can work with. And then finally, we have to resynchronize that with the fMRI bold data to actually use that overt speech in a way that will help us with, with our analysis. So let me kind of talk about how we designed our experiments uh, to let us do that. Uh, so this is effectively the structure of all of our trials, really. Uh, so participants are first given uh, a queue up top that just says, hey, I want you to recall an event from a particular time period. Um, and I'll talk more about the different time periods we used in, in a little bit. Uh, and then after that instruction, they were given a choice of two pictures to use as cues. And we just gave them two pictures because we didn't want people to fail to retrieve an event based on a single picture queue. That's generally unlikely, but we just wanted to make sure in this case. So let's say that the person wants to use this baseball game up here. They push a button. After a short delay, they see a larger version of that for a few seconds. And here they're told, all right, look at this picture and use it just to remember as many different aspects of that event as possible. Just bring those all to mind. Uh, and after that five, after five seconds of doing that, now they're given just about two minutes to then describe in as much detail as possible for the full duration of that trial, the experience, all the things that came to mind. And it turns out, by the way, that people can actually spend about 112 of the 118.8 seconds doing this. So they actually engage pretty well with the task, I would say. Uh, and then finally, there is about a 20 second period before you go on to the next trial. You do three of these trials for each scan. Uh, now, the downside to having two minute long trials is that you just don't have that many compared to a typical event related fMRI uh, design where you'd have many dozens of each trial type. Uh, but, you know, again, that's sort of a trade off we're willing to make here for what we're trying to look at. And then within the autobiographical trials, uh, there are three different time periods because we're doing this ultimately to get to the idea of recent memories and remote memories. So we asked people to either recall events from earlier on the day that they were scanned. Uh, by the way, we scanned people in the afternoon or evening, so it wasn't like they'd been awake for an hour and a half. Uh, alternatively, we could ask people to recall an event from about a year ago, so six to 18 months, but again, you could think of that as about a year, um, or five to 10 years ago. Or to kind of switch back to the more qualitative language I've been using today, you can think of it as definitely a recent memory. Yes, that's a remote memory, and then this intermediate condition is sort of somewhere in between. Uh, now, I mentioned that the downside to having very long trials is that you don't have a ton of trials necessarily in a given experiment. Um, but the good news is that you end up with plenty of data per person. So you still had um, 35, almost 36 minutes of data per participant uh, in which they're describing autobiographical or recall trials, uh, and then 12 minutes in which uh, they are describing pictures. Now, this picture description here is an important control task. Uh, that we included, and it's important for several reasons. So I just want to kind of talk about those right now to just give someone a sense of, of why we randomly ask people to do something other than recalling memories. Uh, and this is something that actually Dan Schachter's group pioneered a number of years back to look at narrative different styles, actually between older and younger adults. Brennan Geyser was, was lead on that. Uh, but the idea is that when you're looking at a picture and you're using it to trigger a memory, then OK, you think back to a memory, and you then have to narrate the memory based on the contents of a picture. And you just talk and talk and talk for a while. So if, on the other hand, what I ask you to do is describe the same type of picture that we're using to cue memories, then you still have to have a complex event that you're keeping in mind and describing for a long period of time. So we're matching for things like motor output requirements. The type of stimulus used to cue information is matched. Uh, and importantly, uh, although it may not be quite as um, clear based on things I've said so far, there's a secondary benefit to using picture descriptions as an active control task in this case. And that is that the hippocampus is always encoding things. You don't get to tell your hippocampus to turn on or off if something's important. It's just doing its job in the background. Uh, and so when you're recalling or when you're describing these pictures, 
you're also encoding that description that you're providing. At the same uh, time, if you're recalling an autobiographical memory, and we talked about this a little bit with multiple trace theory too, right? You're also re-encoding that event. So what this means is that this uh, active uh, baseline condition we'll be using not only equates for things like output and basic stimulus properties, but to a degree also will allow us to say that, hey, if we're seeing activity uh, that's greater in recall trials than in the description trials, then we can really attribute that to retrieval because re-encoding should also be occurring in both cases. So this is going to do some real work for us later on. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get there. Uh, and then finally, just going to make a quick note, we had 40 subjects, so a pretty decently sized sample to, to ask our questions here. Uh, what I want to do now is just focus in on this spoken narration period, since this is really the only part of the experiment that is particularly new compared to what a lot of folks have been doing for a long time. Excuse me. So. People gave us descriptions of events, which I would describe as fairly mundane. So they did not typically talk about weddings. They did not talk about anything like a traumatic experience. Uh, we did have someone talk about being in a shark tank, but that seemed to be a positive thing for them. So that's that's fine. Uh, and what you uh, would become obvious here if you had a chance to look at this a little bit is that they first actually very nicely tell us when something happened. Uh, so five or six years ago, they say where they were, which is a baseball stadium. Um, and then they mention who they're with, and they're just talking about being at a game. Uh, and it turns out that it's hot in July in the summer. And this person is relatively unhappy, apparently, with the heat. So th this is the type of thing that people would share with us. Again, just very typical mundane memories. Um, and what you then have to do is take this and break it up into distinct little chunks of information. Now, fortunately, we didn't have to be the ones to figure out how to do this. In fact, uh, Brian Levine back in 2002 came up with a, an approach called the autobiographical interview. Uh, and what that does is basically have you say, all right, well, what are they talking about at this initial point here? Well, this really is something we can say is about time. So we're gonna call that a time detail. Next, they're saying where, so we'll call that a place detail. Then, all right, I'm with one person, that's a person detail, oh, here's another person, and so on and so forth. You go through this whole transcript, all your transcripts or all your participants, um, and you can break up the entire thing into sort of a predetermined number of decently representative buckets. Now, some of these will be uh, details that are really important and central to the event. We would call these episodic details or in this case, internal details is the typical name we give them. Uh, and these are really like at this point in time, at this place, I did this thing, right? So that's really very specific information. Uh, there's also another category of information called external details, which is basically everything else. So that's if you wander off topic or you just start kind of talking in generalities, we have a way to account for that as well in this scoring procedure. Uh, this is something I know that Sherry has actually uh, worked with extensively as well and even gave me a few pointers on how we can do it better next time. Um, but this is the approach that we used. Uh, and then what we did, now that we've categorized what every single word that was uttered throughout all of our participants sort of counts as, is we can go back and resynchronize it with the original, original verbal descriptions that we were given. So we went back and we can say that, so uh, maybe five or six years ago takes right around three seconds to say, and it's early in the trial. And then we now have a timestamp for every word, which means we have a timestamp for each one of these different types of details. And that means we know what happened and we know when it happened. And to analyze fMRI data, you really need to know two things. You need to know what happened and when it happened. So now we can just treat this as a typical event-related fMRI analysis, except we don't have experimental control over when people are talking about different types of details. We only have experimental control over, are they remembering something that happened recently or a long time ago, or is this a control trial? So if you were to kind of look at that graphically, all right, so the first thing I'm doing here is I have what we call a regressor, which will account for activity in our time series that might be related to hey, now this person's talking about time, when something happened or where something happened. And at the same time, like I said, we also know from our own design of the experiment that they're talking about when and where and who in the context of thinking back to an event that occurred five or 10 years ago. So for those of you who do fMRI in the audience, this is just a mixed block event related design. You can think about it that way. All right, so what I've walked through is a way to get prolonged periods of recall that can be discretized into a way that lets us actually analyze the fMRI data. But all of that is completely moot if the data themselves are unusable because people's heads are bouncing around too much. 
So what I want to do is actually just give folks in the audience a sense of how much it actually costs to move um, or how much movement cost there is to have people continuously talk for three two minute periods of time in the course of an experimental scan. Uh, what you're going to see on the y axis here is the average um, you could think of it as the amount of motion people have every 2.2 seconds, their head is moving a certain amount of in space. Uh, and then you're going to see stacked columns here of eight data points, which is for each of our 40 subjects. And any dots that fall above this red line here, we're going to say have too much motion. We're going to cut them out. We're going to say, nope, you're excluded. We don't trust you as being of sufficiently high quality. Uh, and it turns out, actually, that despite long continuous periods of recall, uh, we don't have a really big problem with head motion in this case. So it might be because we gave people a minute or two to sort of practice with some feedback up front for the type of head motion that occurs. Typically, people like to nod their head when they talk. Everyone does this. You just It's much more obvious in the scanner. Um, but for most people, we actually didn't lose any data. And for the people for whom we lost some data, we tended to lose only a couple of runs. So how much data did we lose overall? Well, not that much. We actually retained about 94% of the total number of scan runs we collected, again, despite these very long continuous periods of, of speaking. Um, so I might hazard to guess that this means that concerns about speaking in the scanner have been slightly exaggerated in the past, although it may have just, you know, I don't know, maybe we just had the best participants in the world in this case. But in any event, we <laughs> this turned out better, I think, certainly than I expected. Um, and I think it's actually very promising for future experiments where we want to do something similar. So now what I'm finally going to do is start talking about some data. Thank you all for your patience getting here. Uh, so what I'm going to begin with now is talking about what people were talking about. So what sort of details and things were people providing to us while they were recalling memories? And did this change between recent events and remote events? Uh, so I'm going to point out just very briefly that actually these data were published earlier this month. So if you have questions that don't end up getting answered for whatever reason today, then please feel free to check out this paper or shoot me an email and I'll share it with you. I'm happy to obviously talk about those, uh, anything about this experiment really. Uh, but to go ahead and, and get to those data that I mentioned. So the first thing I'm going to do, like I said, is just show you what it is that people were recalling. Um, this is not something we needed to do in an fMRI environment. We could have had people do this anywhere, or this is just them recording or uh, being recorded while they, they describe events. Um, but what I want to point out are a few things here. First off, um, it's not the case that as you go from events that occurred today to those that occurred five or 10 years ago, that there is this massive catastrophic drop in the number of internal details. So we didn't see anything like that. In fact, we see around 30 details that are internal. So these are sort of the specific recollective episodic details that we're interested in um, that sort of make up an event as that thing that I feel like I'm experiencing right now. Uh, we see people can verbalize about 30 of those for both the today condition and our six to 18 month ago condition. And we get about 27 and a half for the uh, five to 10 year ago. So certainly it's a little bit farther away, a little bit sorry, farther away. Also, yes, it is a little bit farther away, in fact, by several years. Uh, but what I want to say is that it's a little bit less detailed. Uh, and actually, if you compare the today to 5 to 10, then this little squiggle here means it's like a P of 0.055 or 06 or something. So these are even sort of questionably different at that. Uh, so A, events are in general consistently detailed, and they're highly detailed. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that if you don't have something like overt recall that you've collected in the scanner, then this is absolutely brutal because here it's really hard to this gets us back to the covert place of I don't really know what you're thinking about or really how much you're thinking about various aspects of an event. So whether or not I see differences in hippocampal activity or not is really hard to sort of work with because you just can't you can't really get beyond this point here. On the other hand, because we had people describe verbally what was going on, we can go beyond that and we can say, all, all right, right, AJ, I'm just going to interrupt you there. Sure. Um, I think Malar had a question, uh, maybe perhaps about the motion. Okay. Yeah. Well, how did you know? Uh, going back to a couple <laughs> of uh, slides, I was just wondering if you did anything special to, you know, was it just feedback that you gave people or was there anything else that you did to kind of um, so, improve the acquisition here? Uh, so we didn't do anything like prospective motion correction or anything like that. There were two things we did. One, uh, before they even went into the scanner is we just sort of explained, hey, when you're speaking, when we're having a conversation, 
you're you're moving actually quite a lot. So the only thing you need to move is your jaw. That's literally the only thing that has to happen to talk. And I, I'm not saying this to be condescending. This is what we told them. Um, you know, so we typically nod, we emote, we do all these things very naturally when we're speaking. I'm speaking with my hands right now, right? We don't need to do any of that in the scanner. Uh, and so we really try to impress upon them up front. Just, just really try to focus on only moving your jaw and we'll give you some time to practice doing that in the scanner. Uh, but then once they were in the scanner, I will say we have a real-time motion estimation uh, tool up and running. And I know that there's a couple different versions of this bouncing around now. Ours is run uh, just through AFNI, the imaging analysis software can kind of read it right off the our server. So I always know what you were doing at MR, you know, the, up to the last scan we collected. Um, there's also some things called Firm from WashU and some other folks, but we were monitoring that and we'd let people talk about not a memory from a time period that mattered, but sort of like maybe what they did last weekend kind of thing. And then we'd give feedback on what type of head motion they were doing. And typically it was almost like a nodding. So you could remind people, hey, look, really focus on sort of where the occiput is on, on your pillow and, and just think about that. And you know, you do that once or twice, it takes four or five minutes at most, most of the time, even less. And then you get this. And I mean, with the exception of one particularly bad scan from one particularly bad person, like I'm, it, it just doesn't, um, it, it wasn't nearly as bad as I, again, I would have thought it was. Um, and I can also tell you, we've done other studies uh, that don't involve continuous speech, but just single word, like object naming kind of things. And if anything, the motion there is as bad or worse. So it's almost like once you start talking, you can sort of just keep yourself in a good state. You get kind of find a nice comfy spot for your head. Um, but we didn't use head molds. We didn't um, use tape, you know, or, or any other kind of feedback thing. It was really just, or, or like while they were scanning, you know, it was really just kind of some early verbal, hey, try not to do this as much as you've been doing. Okay, great. And um, we just have another um, question from Daniela Palombo. Um, she's asking whether people take up the entire 118 second um, epoch for the recall. Um, and whether you have any ceiling concerns. And then the second part of the question is whether there's any reaction time differences in the start of the recall. So whether people are slower to start talking um, for remote memories versus recent. Uh, so uh, for the first part, people spoke for about 112 seconds. I think in several cases, it was more like 110, another case maybe like 113, but around 112 in each case. So um, I'd say we're certainly approaching ceiling at that point, but I don't, I don't, it's not like they were speaking for 117.9 seconds every single time. Uh, and there were certainly uh, instances, although not uh, all that frequently where someone would stop very early on. So they'd stop 30 or 40 seconds in. Um, that happened about, I, on average, it was less than one per person. I think the most times that happened was three for a single person. Um, but in those cases, what we would do actually per the autobiographical interview was kind of give them a quick nudge and say, hey, um, is there anything else you can tell us about that event? And uh, either they'd start talking again or more often than not, they would say no. And then we'd have 40 seconds of, of somewhat awkward silence while we waited for the trial to be over. Um, so I think ceiling effects are a concern, especially if in the sense that, um, I shouldn't say they're a concern. There's something to think about in the sense that with an autobiographical interview, like the way it was originally designed, there was never a finite time period. But I do think it was something we sort of had to have a two minute chunk in this point just for designing the experiment. You don't, you only have so much you know, freedom you can do in, in a scanner. Um, but we are, that, that's something we thought about trying to follow up on, maybe see if we can push it out to a three or four minute period and, and see what goes on there. Uh, for the second half of the question, there were not massive reaction time differences, but again, to get back to the, oops, sorry, design, here we go. So I don't want to make too much of the reaction time issue in part because people actually had five seconds here in which we were not asking them to talk, but they should be thinking back to that event. So really the reaction time is how quickly they shift from, I've been thinking about an event to I need to start verbalizing it, which is a very distinct kind of reaction time from, I need to think of an event. Okay, I have it in my mind and now I need to start talking about it. So I, I would not overinterpret reaction times in this particular case. Okay, um, the, her follow-up just, um, she says she's just asking because she's surprised if 
um, surprised that there's not bigger differences in the number of details across time periods. Yes, um, I mean, that, that's a fair point. That's actually something that uh, a couple of folks have kind of brought up with us. And uh, I, I don't know, again, if it's, um, it might just be that there is some kind of ceiling effect. Um, that, like, that is a possibility that I, I can't rule out, of course. But I can also say that if you look at some work that, um, I'm gonna blank on the numbers, but it's work from Don Addison's group, uh, or Don Addison, I think when she was still with Dan Schachter. Um, and they actually don't see differences in the number of recalled details between recent and remote events as well. Uh, and there's a couple other folks that have found the same kind of lack of a difference. So it's not, we're not the only ones to see this, although I will agree that it's a little bit counterintuitive when you think about what I was describing early with events tend to become a little more generic over time. Uh, so um, again, it, it's not without precedent, but I, I don't, since we only had people talk for two minutes and not five or 10, I don't know exactly how far out we'd have to go to start to see uh, a tailing off. Sure, okay. Um, we just have another quick question before I'll let you keep going. Um, so Nathan Springs asking, so back to the motion, um, can you comment on the multi-echo fMRI acquisition and how that related to removal of motion? Uh, absolutely. Um, and thank you, Nathan, that was a great question. Uh, so we, did use multi-echo. Uh, if I didn't say that explicitly, then I should have because we did. Uh, and the data that I'm going to show you, so basically the um, there's kind of two things that happen, or I should say don't happen when you look at the, the normal way you would analyze this versus a multi-echo set. Uh, and the first one is that if you look just at like whole brain effects, they end up looking very, very similar. So, and, and again, I can talk about that a little more when you get there now that it's been like to, to get back to this question there. Um, but with things like the, the hippocampal activity patterns, we very much did need to have multi-echo to see those um, emerge in anything that was not just a lot of null effects in these data. That's something that we have spent a lot of time just trying to make sure that, you know, <laughs> like the, could anyone do this or not is sort of a question. Um, if you didn't use multi-echo data, if you had an old data set lying around, um, how do things look? And in particular, the hippocampal data end up getting very, very messy if you don't have multi-echo denoising. Um, unless you really just like a lot of null effects, in which case then you're, you're in great shape. But, but most people don't want to have that. So it's, it's very beneficial in this case, I would say necessary to have done some kind of multi-echo denoising to see what we saw. Empirically, that's the case. Good question, Nathan, again, thank you. Uh, great, okay, I think you can keep going for now. All right, and here we go. Okay, motion and okay, yes. So number of details. This actually this and this gets to um to Daniela's question as well, I think, which is that although we didn't see a dramatic uh, difference in the total number of recalled details in this particular experiment, that's not to say that we saw that people just recall the same type of thing over and over again. Uh, and instead, what you actually see is a very clear difference in the types of internal episodic details that are being recalled. So activity details, which refer to like things people are doing, tend to be much more uh, prominent and common in events that are described from earlier that same day relative to five or 10 years ago. On the other hand, things like person actually end up appearing less in memories from today relative to longer ago. And there's things like place, which kind of just have this funky U-shaped pattern. So what I wanna do here is not say that any one of these is critically important. But what I want to make it clear is that there's a huge amount of heterogeneity in the types of detail that people are providing um, that seems to change related to time. And so what that then tells us is, again, that if all of these differences are riding on top of what would be considered a, a typical sort of covert recall design, then it's really hard to start to look at something within the hippocampus and say, yes, that's simply because it's a recent memory and not well, it happens to be a recent memory, but maybe it's because people tend to be recalling X, Y, and Z more often, something like that. So, so this, which you could also think even as almost like, well, how vivid is it, right? Something like that, sort of a proxy for that, may hide, hey, it may not be all that dissimilar in terms of the total amount of detail, but the types and kinds of details are, are very clearly different. Um, now, as I mentioned, we went through the steps of uh, not just coding for these, but then resynchronizing these with the fMRI bold data 
uh, with the goal then of uh, trying to account for this activity in some way. And uh, the good news is that that actually works. Uh, and to get to Nathan's question, this, this actually worked just as well when you're using a single echo version of the data set as the multi-echo data that we used. Um, but it turns out that when people are describing different types of details, you can very reliably extract different parts of, or different regions or networks of regions, I should say, um, that support that type of content. So let me just give you a kind of a quick taste of that because again, I think if this part doesn't work, then everything we did is kind of a whole lot of not much. Uh, so here what I'm showing is this is the left hemisphere. Uh, and in orange are regions that are uh, preferentially activated when you're describing a place where something occurred uh, as compared to either a person or activity, so things people are doing. And you can see that there is this distributed collection of regions across the whole frame. Uh, in blue is um, basically localized scene selective cortex based on a very typical visual localizer. So if I show you a block of scenes and compare that to a block of either faces or objects, what's activated preferentially? This is not uh, particularly exciting contrast. People have mapped this out very, very well, but that's what's shown in blue. Uh, and then in green is the overlap. And the emphasis here that I want to make is actually that in kind of the main scene selective regions of cortex, so the posterior angular gyrus slash occipital place area, the parahippocampal cortex, and the retrosplenial cortex, and kind of surrounding parietal occipital sulcus, um, all have very clear overlap when you're describing scenes or when you're perceiving scenes visually. So it does seem like there's some kind of reactivation occurring transiently that we can actually pick out using this type of approach. Similarly, if you're describing some kind of social thing, so either a social agent, a person, or things that agent is doing, an activity, uh, then you see very strong overlap again with uh, how we, in this case, try to localize the default network, which was sort of just like a very generic task negative map. Uh, and we did that because the default network, of course, has been very strongly associated with uh, things like social cognition, um, moral decision making, uh, various aspects of things like that. Uh, and in this case, it's actually very hard to see much in the way that's orange that would be strictly related to the recall contrast rather than our localizer map because the recall map is almost entirely subsumed by said localizer contrast. So again, this is a suggestion that even though people are talking about all sorts of different things um, differently based on whether it's a recent or remote event, right, we're actually able to account for that, uh, that activity in some way. And the goal then by doing this is to say, all right, well, since we can account for what's being said and when, and we can sort of use these transient uh, effects that we've modeled to try to account for, for variance in our data, right? Let's get back to this question then of what's going on differently when you're recalling an event from five or 10 years ago versus let's say today. And let's ask what the heck the hippocampus is doing, right? What is doing differently? So here we go, the remote memory in the hippocampus. Um, when we went to define a hippocampus, uh, we did this uh, in a subject specific manner. We didn't use some kind of group average atlas or anything. Uh, for each subject, we took the hippocampus and we said, all right, um, we understand that there is functional heterogeneity across the long axis. So um, following uh, advice from Jordan Popink and uh, Morris Moscovich and others, we basically said anything that is um, at the apex of the uncus or anterior, that's basically the head of the hippocampus, we're going to call that anterior hippocampus. And anything uh, posterior to that is the posterior hippocampus. So you could think of this alternatively as head versus approximately body tail. Although I can also tell you that if you just look specifically at head versus tail, uh, which we've done as well, you get the same answer I'm about to give you here. Um, but why do we do that? Again, like I said, it's that there is a growing appreciation for a heterogeneity of function. And of course, sort of, I think a longer appreciated heterogeneity of, of structural and functional connectivity, uh, such that the anterior hippocampus tends to be more associated with um, things like abstraction or generalization of details. Um, people talk about it a lot these days with sort of schema extraction or generation. Um, within an event, oops, sorry, within an event, there we go. Um, it also tends to be, um, you could think of it as maybe being associated more with just maintaining sort of the broad associations of all of these things are sort of within a single event. Uh, in contrast, the posterior hippocampus seems to be more involved in the reinstatement of specifics. So not just, hey, you and you and you were all there, but you were there, you were very close to this tree, you were sitting next to that person, and then person number three was off on the side for some reason. So that very strict, precise layout 
um, would be more associated with the posterior uh, hippocampus. Um, just have a question, Adrian. Um, it might be something that you're about to cover with your data, but um, Vani is asking whether there might be an effect of how confident you are with your memory. Um, so whether, for example, that you're more likely to be confident about your memory today versus 10 years ago. Um, so whether it's important to consider the veracity of the memory. Uh, that's a great question. And so I, I'm not sure that anything that we have here will speak to that directly. Um, I'm happy to speculate a little bit about that, um, but what I'm going to do is actually sort of turn that question around and say that I certainly could feel very, very confident in what occurred in a memory today, but if I am sort of volunteering a highly detailed memory from a while ago, and this might even be something I've thought about a fair bit, then it's unlikely that I'm going to be, be nervous and not really sure about it. And if I were, this would actually come out in the way we're scoring the details, presumably, because there'd be a lot of sort of editorial statements, metacognitive kind of uh, tangents or, or qualifications of things. Uh, and that would therefore come out as a great number of, you would call that other expressions in, in the scoring version. And we didn't really see a dramatic shift over time with those, with those metacognitive others. So I'm not saying that means decidedly there's no difference in confidence, but at least in what I think is an obvious way to try to check for it, there wasn't a really clear evidence that that was, that was popping up. That's a really great question though. Uh, we also, we can talk about that a little bit more later as well. There's, um, I'm not gonna talk about it in the main talk, but we see some cortical effects related to temporal distance, which do tend to fall in regions that seem to be more associated with things like subjective confidence during retrieval, um, also just the recency of a memory during retrieval. So that's not a, it's actually a very interesting idea, but I think as a first level explanation, it doesn't, it wouldn't necessarily be what I would jump to in this case. That's awesome. Okay. So um, to, to get back to what we're, um, to get back to the hippocampus here, um, the, what I want to do before I show you the actual data is just refresh everyone's minds on sort of what the standard model is that I talked about 40 odd minutes ago. I'm going to talk about the um, multiple trace theory uh, and sort of what the very clear predictions are in each case. And the good news is that the predictions are actually very distinct within our own data. So the standard model would predict uh, A, that there should be greater activity for recent than remote memories in the hippocampus, because over time the hippocampus should become less and less necessary for recall. And furthermore, if you don't need a hippocampus for remote events, then there should not be a difference in activity between uh, the hippocampus between the, the recall of very remote memories, in this case, our five to 10 year ago condition, and that picture description control task. So to support standard model, we need to have a gradient and the most distant period should not differ from our baseline comparison point. On the other hand, for multiple trace, we see what we'd want to see is first off, assuming that we've accounted for details in the way that we've tried to, you shouldn't see a really clear difference uh, in activity between recent and remote events because we've section that out using our, our uh, the sort of scene and place things I described before. Um, so it should be relatively flat. It shouldn't be, should not be uh, any sort of temporal distance effect there. And critically, if you always need a hippocampus, then you should always see greater activity in the hippocampus during recall than for your control task, regardless of whether that was an event from today or from five or 10 years ago. So in one case, sloped, and only sometimes different, in the other case, flat, always different from our control task. So what do we see? Well, I'm gonna start by describing what's going on in the anterior hippocampus, left and right uh, hemisphere respectively. And uh, I'm not like about to do some reveal where I suddenly show you all these bars. There are no bars. Um, nothing in the anterior hippocampus actually significantly differed as a function of uh, recall period in either hemisphere. This like kind of wanted to get there, but it fell far short of significance. All right. So part A, at least China's looking like maybe there are some multiple trace support there. Let's talk about the posterior hippocampus now. Um, and in the posterior hippocampus, we see a dramatically different story. Um, so here we see a very clear gradient going from the today condition down to the five year ago condition in each hemisphere. Uh, and of course, we're allowed to do that t-test because the actual uh, subregion by, by recall period ANOVA was, that interaction was significant. So. We have maybe some support for multiple trace, what looks like pretty good support for the standard model of consolidation. But now there's that second part of those predictions. So how do things differ from our picture description control task? And in 
whenever you see a double dagger set here, this means that those uh, that level of activity is indeed significantly different from uh, from our control. And so in the posterior hippocampus, we see it for the two recent conditions today in six months. Those significantly differ from our baseline control task, which would be the zero mark down here. And in the anterior hippocampus, uh, no, 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 yes, and no. So five out of six times, there is not a difference. Now, if you were me, or if you were a lot of people that I've talked to about this, you look at those bars and you go, time out. That does not seem visually like that makes sense. Um, so what I want to do is just point out that here, these are uh, error bars that have been corrected for repeated measures since we're looking at three different conditions within the same person, which is very appropriate if you want to look at across these time periods, um, but not really what you want to be showing or visualizing, I should say, um, for activity differences relative to baseline. So how do things look then if we just do a more typical standard error of the mean? Oof. Okay. So this hopefully might explain why we don't <laughs> We aren't seeing all conditions in all cases uh, significantly different from our, our picture description task. It's just that there's a whole lot of uh, variability with respect to the activation above our picture description task across participants, even though there are uh, relatively consistent differences uh, across conditions within any given subject. So uh, what does this tell us then? Well, let's take a look at those models again. So standard model, recent greater than remote. We definitely saw that in the posterior hippocampus. And remote, recall, does not activate the hippocampus above a control task. We also saw that in the posterior hippocampus. So check, looking good. Multiple trace, recent greater than remote. OK, we started to see that in the anterior hippocampus. But we definitely did not see a situation in which the hippocampus was always significantly greater. So. I think what we can at least say in this case is that using overt recall, we have added some new evidence to a long-standing debate that seems to favor the standard model of consolidation. So where do we go from here? Well, Adrian, I, I might just, um, I'm not sure how many slides you have oh, I'm, left. I'm at the this. end. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm sure people have some more questions about your data, so make okay, sure sorry. we right. only have um, a few questions. No so, all right. Uh, I, I can even just kind of stop here. I, I was going to offer a couple, like I said, sort of future directions, but we can even just skip on that past that if you'd like. Uh, and instead, what I'll do is end on the, the really important slide, which is just thanking the folks that, that made this all happen. Uh, so I want to thank Alex Martin, best PI in the world, for being incredibly supportive and always just sort of pushing me to try to do something that was a little bit crazier than I think I wanted to. Uh, Alina and Sarah and Estefania were the RAs that were incredibly, incredibly patient and willing to, to help pour through in huge amounts of data to make this happen. Um, there's a lot of man hours that go into each one of these participants. Uh, Steve Gotts, our staff scientist, just addresses all questions about anything technical. Uh, and Dan Schachter is an endless font of knowledge. So there you go. Finally, I'll just, of course, thank everyone else and uh, take questions. Great. Thanks, Adrian. That was excellent. Um, we'll see if we can um, get through a few questions in the last few minutes. So go on from... Um, Gabrielle Stephanie. Um, so how do these theories account for severely deficient autobiographical memory individuals? So um, does the existence of these individuals imply any predictions which differ between the models? That is a great question. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not sure that the existence of, of that particular population does speak very strongly to one or the other. And I'm only going to say that because I'll be honest and say that I'm not familiar, familiar enough with that specific condition to, to have a sense of, of how it would line up with them. So maybe what I should say instead is that I will admit that I have some, have some additional reading to do before I feel qualified fully answering that. Um, but from the understanding uh, that I do have, it's not really clear how that would shift the predictions one way or the other um, for, for a given model. Sure, okay. Um, so Vani has specifically requested that we see your future direction slide. So um, oh. you can just go back. Okay, all right, uh, fantastic. So here's what we <coughs> wanna do. Uh, first off, if this would let me, there we go. All right, so the one thing I'd love to do uh, is actually just take like one or two participants and scan them once a, month, once a month for one or two years. Just bring them back and ask them to recall the same events each time uh, and track not just behaviorally how the descriptions of an event change over time, then also sort of how the reinstatement effects and even just the sort of 
tonic activity associated with recalling that memory also tends to shift over time. So rather than looking at this cross-sectionally, which is really what we were doing here, uh, we can look at it in more of a longitudinal sense. Um, I think that could actually tell us quite a lot. I just need a couple of crazy participants who are willing to let us do that. Uh, then I think it's also really critical that we start to look at specific hippocampal subfields. So rather than doing this in a three Tesla scanner, uh, we try to you know, do this in something like a 7T scanner and say, hey, is there, you know, we saw anterior versus posterior differences very clearly, but is that being driven by, let's say, CA3 um, or just CA1 or something like that? And we just need a higher field scanner to do that. Uh, and then finally, I want to just borrow a page from uh, Uri Hassan and, and his folks who have been doing really amazing work with, let's say, Sherlock videos. And rather than asking participants to recall events from their own lives, we ask them to recall parts of movies that we actually know that they saw and have direct experimental control over, which of course is something that we don't have in pretty much any other autobiographical memory context. Okay, great. Um, we also have a question from Frederick. Um, I'm not sure if you want to ask that aloud. Right. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilmore. That was a really interesting talk. I was just wondering um, how much inter-individual differences is there in uh, those auto uh, in those activation or those details that are recalled, because I'm guessing that the same picture might not uh, evoke the same emotions or same exact strength of memory between subjects. So I'm just wondering if you could address that. Uh, sure. So actually, the whole point is that it will not, uh, in fact, because we we want people to use cues to help think of a specific memory, but there there is zero expectation uh, that let's say again, that, that baseball picture that I showed before, that you would have the same type of memory that I would have for that. Uh, and so the types of information and detail that people are giving us for any given event is obviously wildly different. Uh, when I was showing you, do, do, do this here before, um, I mean, yes, this, this sort of lets us say that on average, you know, events that occurred longer ago tend to have fewer specific activity related details. Um, and for whatever reason, maybe an event from a year ago had more place details than other events. I'm not really sure why that happened, to be honest. Uh, but, but this is not meant to suggest that there is a lack of, of heterogeneity ac across our participants. Um, I would also point out that, uh, and I think this is very typical of, of studies that look at autobiographical memory or episodic future thinking or things that use this sort of uh, queuing approach. You actually explicitly tell people, we're giving you this cue to help you think of a memory. The cue doesn't have to relate to the memory in any case. So if I show you a picture of a baseball game and you start to think about a time that you were on an airplane, that's completely fine with us. We just wanted you to start to think of an event. Um, so, so I think there is a very, again, I think there, there absolutely will be very large individual differences in how people are, are using the cues, but in a very reliable sense, they're all using them to actually think back to specific episodes. Thank you very much. All right, we have, um, maybe we'll make this our final question. Um, another one from Daniela. She's asking whether you think that having um, people recall the events over and over again in the longitudinal study would alter the consolidation trajectory of those memories. It probably, hold up, Katie. Um, it probably would, sorry, I have a cat who's, who's very interested in this question too. Uh, so, uh, I imagine that it would relative to if you didn't have people do it at all, but I would also say that that doesn't necessarily mean it's a huge problem in the sense that people are giving us memories that they very likely have recalled multiple times before anyway. Uh, and so in that sense, I think we could still learn something. It would just be, a, it would have to be kind of put in the context of this is a case where we have had you repeatedly recall it. Um, and we know that you have. It's not just up to chance. How, how many times have you happened to think of this trip to a baseball game before? But I mean, things like the testing effect make it very clear that retrieval has a very big impact on how we remember something after the fact, you know, among other things. So yes, that, that would be something to consider, but I, don't, I wouldn't call it a deal breaker. Um, Daniela says she has one final question. Um, that was a really nice talk, Adrian. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one question and then I'll shut up. Um, so um, this doesn't explain your findings per se, but I was interested in whether looking at this slide you have up here, whether you notice any differences in the themes um, in terms of the kinds of events, not just the types of detail types, but the themes um, in terms of the kinds of events people select to recall for recent versus remote time periods, because 
we've noticed in our data that there are different, you, you know, we give them retrieval cues like you do, but because they use this free association, they end up recalling different themes of memories for recent versus remote um, time periods. So although this can't explain your data, I was just curious about whether you notice anything like that. That's a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm doing this with my hand and face because I'm trying to, I, we didn't, we haven't quantified things at that level, but I think that's a really fascinating way to take this. Um, what I can tell you is just from having looked at a whole lot of these myself, uh, the, I don't know that there would be a really big difference between uh, the themes of let's say events from that occurred one year ago versus five to 10 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. I can say things like, well, five to 10 years ago, people are more likely to be talking about college or high school than a year ago because these are, you know, um, kind of mid 20s people for the most part. But I don't, I don't know thematically that there's huge shifts for those longer time periods. Uh, for the events from today, I mean, those, those do tend to be just very, very mundane. You know, a trip to the coffee shop is a trip to the coffee shop. Um, but, but I think that's something that we absolutely should look at more in this case, because I think that would be an interesting, we have the data, so. I, and you bring up you bring up a really interesting point in terms of the age of your subjects and the overlap with the reminiscence bump. Um, you might get some more schematized memories for remote experiences, depending on you know things like transition to college or whatnot. Um, that could change the episodic specificity of the recall, like the subjective vividness, which I know you didn't measure here, but that would be really interesting to look at. So if you have a lot of schema knowledge, you might be able to conjure up a lot of AI type details, but those memories might differ in the phenomenological experience that um, participants bring to bear. So just something to think about. Um, really nice talk. Uh, it was so clear. I really enjoyed it. And this is a really cool uh, method. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, we should talk about that more someday at some point when you get back into real world conference space. Um, For sure. Great. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Adrian. That was a really um, comprehensive and uh, really nice methods and, and exciting data. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I believe you've agreed to stick around if there's any uh, trainees that um, want to continue the discussions with Adrian over our um, virtual student lunch. Um, you can feel free to, to stay on the call. But um, thanks again for the excellent talk.